I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin from the New York Times, and welcome back to the DealBook DC Policy Project. We're thrilled uh, for you to join us again. And we have uh, an important conversation um, right now in the next half an hour uh, with two people in the midst of, frankly, the headlines. Um, and we're gonna have a conversation about policy and markets with Vlad Tenev, the CEO of Robinhood, uh, who has been uh, in the headlines virtually every day uh, for the past several weeks and uh, appearing in Congress uh, just uh, last week. So uh, we'll, we have lots to talk to him about it. We also have the former chairman of the SEC with us, Jay Clayton, uh, as we dig in and maybe even geek out a little uh, on policy uh, and what happens next. So thank you both uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you both. So, uh, so Vlad, you've, you've answered a lot of questions uh, over the past couple of weeks, including an interview that, that we did together, but then, of course, uh, a day long uh, on Capitol Hill, virtually, of course. Um, and so I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the GameStop scenario, in, in part because I, I think it's, it's somewhat well understood. I'm sure that if people do have questions, and I should mention, if you have questions, please put them in the comments, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to bring them uh, to everybody. But uh, where I want to start this conversation is a couple of big policy ideas, I think, have come out of this GameStop scenario. One is the issue of payment for order flow and, and how the public should think about that and, and perhaps whether there should be different regulations or policy around that. Uh, there's the issue of shorting um, and how uh, shorting works and how disclosure around shorting works. There's the issue of social media and what it means to manipulate a stock and what it means to have a social media enabled universe talking about stocks and how we should think about that. And there's so many other uh, elements to this. Uh, but let's start with the issue, Vlad, if we could, of, of payment for order flow, because it seemed to be something that came up over and over again during, uh, during the course of the hearing last week. And also because I think the public looks at your business model, which in large part, the revenue model is payment for order flow, meaning Citadel Securities and others are effectively paying you to execute trades on, on behalf of your clients. And people say, well, guess what? The client actually isn't the Robinhood user. The client is Citadel. How do you think about that? And how do you think the public should think about that? Well, I think, um, I think there's a lot of different policy questions that are entangled with the payment for order flow question. I think where I want to start is uh, people didn't pay much attention to payment for order flow up until recently because you had trade commissions. And if you look at it holistically, trade commissions were a much more significant source of revenue for the brokerages. I mean, you look back at 2019, where they all dropped commissions in quick succession, you had a uh, some of these companies, you know, their stock prices declined 35% in one day, you know, 25%, 35%, they ended up consolidating, presumably because uh, they weren't able to make the model work as standalone independent companies without commissions. So we've gone from, we've gone from skepticism that the model without commissions could work at such a low margin to um, sort of talking about the one remaining transaction-based revenue opportunity that remains in the system. And I'm actually in favor of this being discussed. Like uh, generally, I think we make progress when all revenue gets replaced with higher efficiency and more and more uh, costs get passed back to customers. Uh, but I think you look at this industry-wide, um, this type of margin destruction is rarely seen, right? There was significant margin destruction in the brokerage space, and it's it's harder to run a brokerage business than this way than it was uh, with commissions. Um, and you know, I, th I think there's a lot of related questions that we can dive into with payment for order flow. One has to do with kind of the lit exchanges and whether. Um, whether price discovery is impacted as more and more retail flow goes, uh, goes through market makers rather than landing at, at the lit exchanges and whether there needs to be sort of some consideration to that. Uh, I think as, as recently as December, it was the first time that um, 
that more trades uh, were executed off exchange than on exchange, which I think was a was a really interesting, probably not super reported on milestone. Um, and then there's the interest. Uh, there's obviously questions about uh, best execution and what it means and uh, and how payment for order flow uh, fits into it. I mean, my perspective, and I'm sure that the chairman has a great perspective on this. Payment for order flow is necessary to generate. It's necessary to generate some revenue to cover our costs of running this business. Um, it, you can think of it as a, a profit share between market making, which is also a for-profit business, and the introducing broker. In this case, Robinhood. Right. And you know, you can ask the question: Is it reasonable to allow market making to be for profit? Is it reasonable for their? If yes, is it reasonable to allow a profit share between market makers and brokers? And I would argue it's it's also the answer to that is yes. But these are all questions that I think should be explored more deeply. Jay, in your role uh, running the SEC, I'm sure you looked at this issue. Do you look at it as a conflict of interest and? And more importantly, when you look at the issue of price discovery and whether the customer is actually getting the best price, do you think that customers using Robinhood or using any of the exchanges that are, that are, that are getting payment for order flow are being um, effectively uh, disserved uh, or misserved as a result of it? Andrew, um, a, a couple of things. You know, anytime you have a principal agency relationship, you're going to have conflicts. You have somebody doing a service for you, but also making money themselves. And it's, it's inherent in our um, securities arch architecture. So part of, part of what you do with regulation is manage those conflicts so that they have the least impact possible. Okay. Number one, Vlad went over something that um, was very important here, which is trading costs money. We need a resilient system. We need a system where people actually have liquidity, where they have the ability to trade from time to time. What we try to do as regulators is bring competition to that system. It's going to cost money. It's going to cost infrastructure to be a participant, to be a market maker, to be a broker. Um, what we want is to drive competition between brokers, drive competition between market makers, and do it in a way that the costs of trading are driven down, yet still resilient, still liquidity. And that has happened. That has happened dramatically over the last two decades. And now we're at a new point. We have a new flow into the system. We have much more retail flow for now. As, as Vlad mentioned, we used to look primarily to what they call the lit exchanges, your traditional exchanges, NASDAQ, right. uh, stock exchange, um, for, for our benchmarks, because that's where most of the action was taking place. As Vlad mentioned, a lot of the action due to right. pushing competition has moved off that we need to look at that. Ken, um, um, Vlad, let me ask you this. I, I talked to um, Ken Griffin last week, and he made the argument that he can give your clients effectively better pricing and better price discovery and better price improvement going through him than if you were to do it yourself, either to internalize the trading yourself or to take it straight to an exchange. Do you agree with that? Well, I think there's a couple of things there, right? One is exchanges charge fees for marketable orders. So if if you route an order on exchange, regardless of whether you're, um, you know, retail or an institutional participant, you pay what's called the taker fee, which is roughly, you know, 25 to 30 mils per share. So about a little bit less than a third of a penny per share, um, which obviously, uh, already sets you behind. Then you have the uh, the NBBO, which means that any uh, anywhere your order is executed, um, it has to be it has to be at NBBO or better by Reg NMS uh, with certain restrictions. But generally, NBBO is the bet is the benchmark, and that's the best price available on all lit exchanges. So not only do market makers have to meet or beat uh, NBBO as per Reg NMS, um, they also can save on the liquidity taker fee. Right. Let, let, let's well, let's try to keep out of the uh, the acronyms because I'm worried that we even I may not follow where we are all, all the time either, and I'm sure some of our viewers may not either. But I, I guess the big question is: 
Do you think that you could go become a market maker, for example, or just use the exchange and get a better price than what effectively Citadel or others that would be providing you the, the payment for order flow? Because there has to be a benefit to them, right? They're not doing this for their health. Yeah, market making is a for-profit business. Uh, it's competitive. And, you know, Citadel Execution Services is one of seven market makers that we route to that provide this service. So um, I think our, our focus has been on serving our customers and improving uh, customer facing features. And, you know, vertical integration is something that we've done on the clearing side. Um, well, one of the things that you probably saw through the GameStop side is we have Robinhood Financial, which is uh, our customer facing broker dealer to put it simply. Then we have Robinhood Securities, which is a clearing broker dealer. So we've, we've vertically integrated that. Um, but vertical integration comes at a cost to just building more things that customers want from us. So there, there's always a trade-off there. And we feel like there's actually a pretty vibrant market of market makers. Citadel Execution Services gets a lot of attention because they have large market share, but they have large market share because they provide customers with superior execution quality. And as I said in my testimony, our system is set up so that if someone else, if another market maker provides superior execution quality on any range of stocks, our system automatically would reroute more of the orders to that market maker. So, you, so, so th there's no part of you that feels that your customers are at a disadvantage at all? The, the way we've set up our entire router, no, to be clear, the, the way we've set up our router is to optimize for execution quality. And it's set up to automatically route orders to where they're getting the, the best execution quality. Let me, let me uh, pivot to another topic uh, that's, I'm sure, near and dear to both of your hearts. Uh, and that is uh, the, the execution time with which a trade is both made and then completed. And, and this became a very big issue for you, Vlad. And I know it's something the SEC is looking at right now more broadly, which is how long it should take uh, to effectively complete a transaction in part because of the amount of deposits you had to put up. It's actually what prevented you or, 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 pre or prevented some users from being, being able to buy shares of GameStop because you didn't have money on the other side to put up as a deposit. And right. right now it takes two days. And I know you've been advocating to try to bring that down to zero. Do you think that's plausible? Well, I think there's actually two issues that this solves that are, that are both issues here. Um, one is we just need a better way of tracking these shares. So right now, I, I, I think it's pathological that you can have greater than 100% short interest. And it's because we're unable to track it. You know, if, if I own a stock and then uh, I lend it to someone who shorts it and then someone else buys it, that buyer doesn't know that it's been, that it's been lent before. So the, the system's not tracking how many times a stock has been shorted. So I think... Uh, the, another benefit to upgrading the settlement infrastructure is that not only can you speed up settlement time, but you can actually improve how you track these shares. And we should know exactly what the chain of custody for, for all of these shares has been and how many times it's been shorted. Um, so I, I think there's, there's multiple benefits to this uh, for the system over the long term. Jay, there seem to be powerful interests, though, that uh, are not necessarily interested in shortening that uh, period. Well, I, look, Andrew, I think that um, I think time has come for that period to be shortened. Um, there, there, there are costs to that period being two days. It's down from three days. The SEC has done a nice job over time bringing it down from five to three to two. But there's the time value of money. The amount of the amount you need to finance those two days of, of an open position. And then there's the uncertainty associated with time. And both of those are driving some of the things that we witnessed. Um, there is no reason with the technology we have available today that that can't be shortened significantly, whether it goes to what people refer to as T0 or T a half, um, you know, but it can be shortened significantly and it should be. And somewhat separately, but uh, I agree with Vlad as well. That, that tracking and information regarding short positions, for example, should be more real time than it is today. The, 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 let me just say this, the securities lending operations are similar to the settlement cycle. 
we trade in milliseconds, but we settle and lend in days. Um, I say, you know, we do it electronically, but these other things we do by the mails, they need to be brought into harmony. Let me ask you a question about shorting though, because Vlad, Vlad raised it uh, right now. And we saw it with GameStop, uh, 140% of the float outstanding effectively was short. Do you think that should be allowed? Well, I think that's a little bit of a misnomer, Andrew, because as Vlad, as Vlad explained it, you know, you have, you have a share, somebody owns it and is long. They, they, they lend it out, the person sells it, they're short, but the person who buys it is now long. So, you know, for each of those sales in the marketplace, you have another long person. So, you know, we have, we have a lot of people short at 140%, but we, we don't have just 100% long, you know, probably have maybe 180 or 190% long, but people need to understand that that's the dynamics. And with more real-time reporting around it, um, they will. So what about disclosure when it comes to shorts? Do you think that hedge funds and professionals should, should be disclosing in the same way they have to disclose their long positions? Do you think it should be uh, instantly disclosed to the market how much short interest there is in a stock so that you don't get into these types of situations? Well, Andrew, I think there's a big difference between aggregate short interest and disclosure of specific short positions. You know, we, we don't make people disclose their long positions until they get significantly large. Um, I, I don't think we should make people disclose their short positions unless they're, you know, they're substantially large over, the, over that threshold in the long way. Um, because you don't want people to be singled out. Uh, we don't want them to not have access to company information because they may, they may be short. I mean, that's, that's an age old debate. But in terms of aggregate information in the marketplace around short positions, that should be robust. Vlad, uh one of the other issues that this has all raised is a lot of shareholders say, I didn't realize that brokerage firms like yours are actually lending out my shares to other people. I'm long this stock. I didn't know that I was lending it over here. And by the way, index funds are doing this every day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, a lot of people, it's clear, don't really understand the plumbing of how the financial system works. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's complicated. Um, it's, there's, there's a lot of legacy infrastructure out there. And um, sometimes, you know, I think one of the benefits is people are understanding it a little bit better now. And, you know, there, there's more attention on short selling and stock borrow and payment for order flow. And I think uh, everyone's just getting educated more quickly. Um, I think this multi shorting thing, uh, the point is, is interesting, because while there is, a buyer and a seller. You also have the the fact that the stock is being borrowed multiple times, and I think it, it creates some sort of runaway chain reaction where if you short the same share, you know, ten times, twenty times, well, then if it gets recalled, there's sort of like ten holders of that share, and you have to go out to market and and buy uh, to to fill all of those and. You know that that's a lot of what causes this short squeeze dynamic to begin with. So I think there's an interesting policy question that should be discussed: How many times should we let the same share be shorted? Like, I I think there's an argument that the answer should be one. Um, I think you know I'm not going to say um, I, I don't think short selling is inherently wrong, but if you short sell the same share hundreds of times. Um, I don't know if people have really studied the effects of that and what how things would be different if if there was some limitation. And I do think there is some precedent for it because, for example, if you have a cash account, there's what's called a good faith violation. You can't just use unsettled funds indefinitely. They they break the chain after one purchase. So if you buy if you buy a stock with unsettled cash. Um, you won't be able to sell it without getting what's called a good faith violation. So I think there's something similar, something analogous for short selling that that might be might be worth considering. Jay, what do you think about the idea of some kind of toggle on, toggle off feature when an investor is on a Robinhood uh, or or invests in a in an index fund and they have to they can say right then and there, um, yes, you can lend my shares out. No, you can't lend my shares out. I know it's in the agreement, but nobody reads these agreements. Well, I'm glad we're having this conversation because it, it is a good thing for investors to understand about whether the shares that are 
that are held in their account can be lent out or not. Um, you know, the general, the general uh, structure is that if you're in a margin account, your shares can be lent out. Um, if you're not, um, you have the option for them to be lent out or not. But it does, it does generate revenue for those who are um, the lenders of shares. Um, and you know, that's, it's part of our ecosystem. I agree with Vlad that we ought to be looking at this. And I do also believe that transparency around this will, will um, have a salutary effect. You won't see, the, as let's put it this way, you won't see as many spikes if it's pretty apparent um, uh, how much of a short position there is. If, if BlackRock couldn't though, Jay, uh, lend the shares out, what would happen to the price of these index funds? I mean, I'm just trying to understand what the implications would be. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly how much money any particular firm makes, but I, but I do think um, share lending activity generates um, meaningful revenue. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Um, and it probably brings down the costs of some of these funds. It's also, from a broker-dealer perspective, uh, an additional source of liquidity. So, for example, one of the reasons why uh, securities lending is um, sort of more automatic for margin accounts is the, the money that brokers lend uh, to customers to borrow on margin has to come from somewhere, right? And so if, if, if securities lending was not available as a way to raise capital, a broker would have to use their corporate cash. And we, we know that that can create some pathological issues. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the broker uh, consideration. It's a, it's a way to raise capital on the markets. Let me ask you another question about just the, the nature of social media and the idea now that you can see groups forming on social media to go buy or short a stock. And, and Jay, I'll go to you first on this. How does this change the idea of stock manipulation? Uh, historically, the SEC has uh, very aggressively uh, gone after people who are considered groups, uh, but this seems different. Well, Andrew, that, look, there, there, is, there is a difference between the classic pump and dump, which is you take a company that probably doesn't do very much, you go out to um, unsuspecting folks and you say, you know, buy this stock, this company's poised to take off, you create some demand in the marketplace yourself by, by buying a few shares. And then, you know, as the tide rises, you, you sell out. Okay. And that's terrible behavior. It's behavior that, you know, we, we all abhor. It's bad for our markets. Um, you know, that's different from, let's go to the complete benign end of the spectrum. Pe people on social media saying, you know what, I've done my research. I like this company. You know, let's, let's sort of buy in it together. Um, one of the difficult things for regulators is life is almost always somewhere in between. And what, what you're really worried about is people using social media to, to do something that's much closer to the boiler room pump and dump than it is to the, hey, we have a view, um, we're consumers on this stock. And uh, you know, I, think we, I think we should be looking at this. Like, are they, are, are there, is there laddering behavior? And you know, let me just say for your retail investors out there, you know, in low priced, thinly traded stock or stock with substantial short interest like we saw or, or um, technicals that are out of whack, the opportunity to have this kind of behavior, this kind of bad behavior increases significantly. So, you know, have your eyes and ears open around particularly those situations. Hey, Jay, what, what do you think though, when you see prominent people, including the, the, the likes of Elon Musk or Chamath Palihapiti or others, using their, their, their social media megaphone or platform to push a stock one way or the other. How, how does that, how, that's, that's a new phenomenon. Well, in, in some ways it's a new, again, in some ways it's new and in some ways it's not. I mean, we, we know of many traditional investors um, who build up a position, announce that they have a position and then the halo effect, the stock rises, okay? And you know what, that's great. That's fine. That's, you know, they're, they're, they're long. They tell other people they're long. They must see some value in the company. Fine. What's, what's disturbing is if somebody comes on and says, hey, I have this position, stock rises, and then the next day they're out. That's, that's a lot different. Right. And, and, and that, you know, I'm not going to get into the legality or, or, or not. That disturbs me much more than, hey, I'm taking a long-term investment view. I'm now in. Join me. Versus, this is great. 
um, but I might not be here tomorrow. Vlad, what do you make of the, the social media end of this? And the other thing I was going to mention is there are some exchanges that now seem to be more and more, I shouldn't say exchanges, uh, online apps and brokers, brokerage firms effectively that seem to be tie, tying their service to social media in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what the chairman said is spot on. I think from a, from a user experience standpoint, over the long run, the best user experience is going to win, right? And so now you've seen... Uh, people on social media discussing their trades and then going going to their brokerage and executing their trades. But you can see a world where actually it's simpler for these to be integrated and for there to be platforms where your trades are automatically posted in a feed, people are following you, um, and then you can you can you can really easily tap to buy a stock. Uh, and then I think uh, you have to ask. What are the are are our regulatory guidelines adequate currently for that type of world, um, or do they need to be updated? Do we have to think through what constitutes a recommendation? Is Reg BI sufficient? Does it provide enough clarity around what happens there? Um, what what characterizes an investment group? And I think I think there's a force. I mean, we've seen it in in January and early February. It's pushing in this direction, and uh, I think it'll be there before we know it. Okay, we're going to run out of time, so I'm, I'm going to go rapid fire. A couple quick questions. Vlad, uh, one, you guys just announced the new plan uh, to uh, have um, a voice, phone calls, meaning that you can call or, or interact uh, as a customer uh, with your company in a way that you couldn't before, but it still doesn't appear that it's the same, that, same way that, that Fidelity would do it, meaning I could probably call Fidelity now, and I think they'd pick up. Why, why haven't you invested more in just straight, somebody picks up the phone and talks to you? Well, we, we believe that the solution we're building is the best solution in the long run. Uh, it's still early. We still support sort of a limited number of high severity use cases like, um, like options and account security related issues, but we're looking to expand it aggressively. And it's actually been you, in the works but, since last year. But have you ever uh, thought of just saying, you know what, we're gonna invest right now. We'll, we're gonna throw a lot of money at this for the next six months to a year. We're gonna hire a ton of people to answer the phones to be, so that people can actually get somebody on the phone. And over that same period of time, we'll invest in the infrastructure so that we can make it more efficient down the line. We, we are making those investments as well. I mean, we're opening a lot of centers. We've opened a lot of new centers through the pandemic. But if you look at it from actually a user experience standpoint, if a customer calls into a 1-800 number, there's a process. First, you have to identify whether that customer is who they're saying they are. Then you have to like pull up their account information and figure out what their trades are. So you're already taking a huge amount of time and friction into it. Whereas with our solution, you can go in the app. The customer's already authenticated. They can select from a drop down which trade they're having issues with. They select it. Then they get connected to a live agent who already has all of that information presented to them. So the efficiency and, and the customer experience for this type of approach, I think, is superior. That's why if you order something from Amazon, they use kind of a very similar phone support callback based approach because it's not just more efficient for the company, but it's a better customer experience for the shopper. Um, and, and so I think we can obviously improve, but I think we're, we're making the investments in the right places. And I, we have a fantastic team working on this, like the things that they're doing with machine learning and matching and automation um, are, just, are just awesome. And I think you'll see really, really fast improvements here. Jay, a uh, Bitcoin question for you, since it seems to be the topic du jour pretty much every day these days. Uh, we now have a number of big companies, including Tesla and others, that are buying Bitcoin for their balance sheet. And one of the issues that's come up is whether companies uh, that buy Bitcoin to put on their balance sheet, whether their own executives and boards are also owning Bitcoin personally, and how do you think regulators will look at that? Well... You know, anytime you're in a in a fiduciary situation like that, and a company is taking an action, it, it's sort of fundamental corporate law that you need to think about whether you're taking an opportunity or creating an opportunity in a way that is selfish. For lack, I'll use I won't use legal terms, but you know, for example, as a board member, I think you'd need to ask yourself: Well, 
if I'm if I'm long a particular uh, security or want to get long it, is my authorizing the company to do that? Am I doing that because I'm long it or because the company should be? Um, you know, those are those are thorny legal questions that Andrew, I would say people need to think about. But but here's the issue, right? It's not considered Bitcoin's currently not considered a security. I don't know what the policy would be if uh, executives were to start buying up different currencies, knowing uh, what their companies were doing relative to currencies, sometimes hard to move uh, such, a, such a large market. Bitcoin happens to be still a, a relatively smaller market, right? Well, the, the, that is a good question. Like, let, let me give you an example in the security space. I don't think anybody would say if company A was gonna go buy company B, that you'd, that you'd want your directors and officers to go buy stock in company B before company A made that announcement. But if company A is going to increase its holdings and treasuries, a market that's really not going to move, you know, you're not going to tell people, oh, you can't buy treasury securities. So there's a, there's a spectrum there, but you really need to think about that. And it's not just securities. We're talking about fundamental fiduciary duties. If, if, I, own a, if I own a piece of property and the company's thinking about buying a piece of property next to it, you know, that's one where you have to think long and hard about whether you ought to be approving uh, that transaction or... Right sitting out. So company, you know, just because we're in new space doesn't mean that sort of fundamental aspects of corporate law don't apply. Okay. Final question to, to, to Vlad, if I could. Um, it's really about whether you think the market unto itself is fair. And, and the question I ask you is a question I asked, actually asked uh, Ken Griffin last week, which is I said, does my mother have the same opportunity to do as well as you? And he effectively said, no. He <laughs> said, you know, if he went out on the golf course with Tiger Woods, he would be, uh, he would lose. And, and what that says about the idea of democratizing the market, I appreciate we all want to have, we will all talk about democratizing the market, but to what end, if to some degree, it's not the same course for everybody? Yeah, that's a very important question. I, I appreciate you asking me that question. <laughs> um, so I think what Ken, I, I listened to that interview, by the way, I think what Ken meant is that if your grandmother wanted to do high frequency trading or market making strategies, it would be very, very difficult to, um, to compete against Citadel and Virtue and some of these firms who are spending, you know, billions of dollars a year in technology and they have the microwave towers between Chicago and New York and all of the market centers. But I think it's almost the premise of the question is flawed because your your grandmother is not going to be doing market making and high frequency trading strategies. So retail investors aren't competing in the same way at the under the same they're not playing the same game. And I actually think if someone is uh, buying and holding a stock or uh, perhaps even you know, trading using a longer time horizon strategy, the technology advantage of microwaves matters less, right? And so I, I think there's never been a better time and a lower cost way of entering the markets as a retail investor. And, and the premise of the question that somehow you're competing against these market makers for you know, who's going to predict how Tesla is going to do over the next six months to 12 months or, or any other stock I think is, is flawed. Andrew, if I can come in on this. Comment on that, but, but let me just add one other piece to it, which is we can take the high frequency trading piece of it out. I imagine that Ken Griffin has access to, to more data, to more resources, uh, to satellites in the sky that show pictures of parking lots, uh, things that my mother and, and you and I uh, probably don't have access to. Yeah, look, and, and look, people should understand that. Um, as a, I love retail investor participation. And, and, as, and as Vlad mentioned, investing for the long term. The, the shorter the time frame, the more the professional investor, whether it's an uh, uh, investment in technology or investment in research, the, the, the better advantage they have over, over you and me or, you know, or, our, or our mothers. And you should recognize that. That's why if people say, aren't you excited about retail participation? I am as investors. You now, the, the closer you get to trading and trying to make money trading every day, the more I want to know that that person is quite sophisticated. 
Um, I should mention we're getting in the comments. You guys don't know today's grandmothers. <laughs> so uh, on that note, I want to thank both of you for the conversation. Uh, it was an education for me and hopefully it was an education for all of us. I hope we can continue this and we can hopefully see each other and have this conversation in person very, very soon. We want to thank everybody uh, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully in just a little bit at 5.30 p.m. tonight. We're going to spend time with Senator Mitt Romney as we close out uh, this Dealbook DC policy uh, forum that we've been putting together, this project. Uh, and again, we want to thank uh, both of our guests this afternoon. See you in a little bit. <laughs>